News. Rudy Giuliani says it may be, quote, the last best chance special counsel Robert Mueller has to secure President Trump's testimony. The president's legal team now laying down a deadline for its negotiations. We have now given him an answer. Uh, he, he obviously, he should take a few days to consider it. But we should get this resolved. We do not want to run into the November elections. So you back up from that. This should be over with by September 1st. Good evening. In primetime, I'm Harris Faulkner in tonight for Martha McCallum. September 1st is a little more than three weeks away and a short time for the time for the two sides to come to an agreement. Uh, considering these negotiations have been in the works for months, the president has said publicly that he'd like to answer Mueller's questions. His lawyers have said the same. And today, the president's legal team made a counteroffer to the special counsel playing hardball as it negotiates the terms of a potential interview. Some reports indicate the offer includes a condition. The president won't be asked about obstruction of justice. So this is where the attorneys stand tonight. But what about President Trump's state of mind? Senator Lindsey Graham spoke directly with the president about all of it. He joins me exclusively in moments. First, Chief National Correspondent Ed Henry live in Washington with Fox Top Story. Ed? It's great to see you. The president's legal team is also saying tonight this is a good faith attempt to try and meet the special counsel part of the way and wrap up this investigation, as you say, by September 1st. Important because that would be ahead of the midterms. And while that may seem like a stretch at this point in the game, the fact is earlier this year, Robert Mueller signaled he would have most of his work done by the summer. And that deadline has clearly been blown away. Back in April, the Washington Post reported Mueller was planning to release at least two big reports on the Russia probe in various stages. The first coming in June or July, focus on whether the president was involved in obstruction, and a second report later on the broader question of Russian interference. The caveat back then, according to the Post, was that in a meeting with the president's legal team months ago, quote, Mueller reiterated the need to interview Trump both to understand whether he had any corrupt intent to thwart the Russia investigation and to complete this obstruction of justice portion of his probe. Now, Mueller originally proposed a wide-ranging interview with the president. His attorneys, Rudy Giuliani and Jay Sekulow, believe that could set up a series of perjury traps. So after the special counsel last week offered to tighten the focus somewhat, Giuliani and Sekulow today tried to narrow it even more shying away from questions for the president about obstruction, in part because they're making the case the president has vast executive power to hire and fire officials like former FBI Director James Comey. And on Secular's radio show today, he and Giuliani offered an extraordinary window into their strategy deliberations, admitting they will be second-guessed if the president goes forward with the interview and it all blows up, but saying it's his call even if they advise against him doing it. Watch. If the president puts up, goes up for an interview, they're going to say, why would these lawyers let him do it? The same lawyers, if we don't allow, if we recommend him not do an interview, they're going to say, uh, what are they hiding? There is no win for the lawyers here, but we have to do what's best for our client. Our client is the president of the United States, and uh, we, we can make sure that um, he's protected, but he has to ultimately make the decision himself. Bottom line, these two sides are still pretty far apart because Mueller wants to press questions like obstruction. And if they do not agree to a voluntary interview, Mueller may have to subpoena the president. He's threatened that privately, a battle that could go all the way to the Supreme Court. Harris? I bring now my first guest who recently talked with the president directly about the Mueller investigation, <laughs> and it happened during a golf game, so that's the connection there. <laughs> South Carolina Senator Lindsey Graham is with us now, member of the Senate Judiciary Committee. Great to see you tonight, Senator. Thank you. So the president brings this up on the golf course. How does that happen, and what did you tell him? He said the same thing to me that he says to everybody when he's out in public. He thinks this is a witch hunt. He didn't do anything wrong. I said, Mr. President, I've seen no evidence of collusion between you and the Russians. I don't think you collude with your own government. Why do, you, why do we think you collude with the Russians? I've been looking <laughs> at it for two years. You just got to be patient and let it run its course, and it will. And uh, we're going to make sure he's treated fairly. And 
nothing untoward. He didn't suggest anything other than he's frustrated, and I don't blame him for being frustrated. This thing's going on for a very long time. Yeah, and, and that frustration played out. I, I know I've heard you say that it was about 20 or so times that he asked you about this. Uh, I was joking. Okay. I was joking. <laughs> All right. Well, what, what did you want him to kind of really hook into as we go forward? Because as I understand it, yes, you've got to be patient, but you said you don't want to hand losses to Republicans. How would that go? Well, if we shut down the Mueller investigation politically, then it would be the only only thing anybody talked about. It mm. would, uh, you know, take off the news, all the great things the president's done on foreign policy and domestic. And, you know, let's just let this thing go. If he doesn't issue a report soon, then I hope he'll wait to after the election. Again, I've looked at this thing pretty close. I've seen zero evidence of collusion between uh, the Trump campaign, President Trump, and the mm -hmm. Russians. Uh, there was an effort to meddle in our election by the Russians. Oh, collusion right. and meddling are two different things. Uh, Trump beat Clinton, not the Russians. And I told the president, you just gonna have to let it run its course. I know you're frustrated, and uh, we'll see what happens here. Uh, other advice that you might have given him, you know, the big story today is the <laughs> handing off now, the response, if you will, from the president's legal team, the handing off their yeah. list of what they'd like to see as conditions <laughs> for a sit down with Bob Mueller. What do you say about it? Well, I, we didn't talk about that. And again, the president is frustrated with the, the investigation going too long. He thinks uh, mm -hmm. he did nothing wrong. The full season passed. And, you know, he makes a good point. Look at what they did with the Clinton email hey, investigation. Uh, the FBI season. agent in charge of the Clinton email investigation hated Trump, liked Clinton. Nothing's happened. The FISA warrant uh, came from a uh, document prepared by somebody on the Democratic Party's payroll, and he feels like there's a double standard here. One of the things that we didn't talk about, I didn't know about it until yesterday, apparently about five years ago, the FBI told Dianne Feinstein one of her employees may be an agent uh, of the Chinese government. That was the right thing to do, and she fired them. I'm going to send a letter to uh, Director Ray next week and ask him, what is the policy? Why didn't you tell President Trump that you had concerns about Carter Page? Is there a double standard here? If this was a counterintelligence investigation, not mm -hmm. a criminal investigation, uh, the FBI should have told President Trump they had concerns about Papadopoulos and Page. Why didn't they do for Trump what they did for Feinstein? Yeah, I want to step back just a second to Dianne Feinstein. The, the senator was made aware. She then went on ahead and fired this yeah. spy. Right. Uh, and and now you're sending a letter to Christopher Ray. Are you are you feeling like that needs more investigation right now? You and what better you, believe it. Okay. What do you want him to do exactly? And do we need to step back even yeah. further? Sure. Yeah. And, and take a look at anybody else. I'm saying, what the hell's going on at the FBI? Why do, why do you tell a Democrat when they hire somebody connected to China? It could happen to anybody's office. Right. When the FBI finds out that somebody's working for us, may have connections to a foreign government, they should tell us, and Dianne Feinstein acted responsibly. Uh, when it comes to the Trump campaign, why didn't they tell him about Papadopoulos or Carter Page? And at the end of the day, what has Carter Page did wrong, uh, has done wrong? Senator, He's still walking around a free man. When I said step back, Paul Manafort is on trial right now. Why didn't the FBI discuss Paul Manafort with the Trump campaign in more detail? So, I, I mean, I, uh, that's what I mean. How this far back do we need to go? The, here's the point. A counterintelligence investigation is designed to protect American institutions from infiltration. The right thing for the FBI to do is if they find somebody's working for a political campaign or bank or any part of the government, is to inform the people in charge that this person you hired has got unsavory connections. That's what they did for Feinstein. Why did they not do that when it came to Manaport, Gates? and Papadopoulos. Why did they ignore that? Right. If they did have a confidential informant, what did the informant learn about uh, the Trump campaign in Russia? Apparently nothing. I'm breaking news with that letter that you're going to give to the FBI director, and I didn't mean to put more names on your list, but as we look at who might have told whom what, uh, those certainly seem like a couple of names that need to be added, as you just said. I want to talk about Iran. I read a statement sure. from you today, and it was one of those <laughs> things where if would it have made a difference a few years ago if the Iranian citizens had had somebody uh, to advocate the way you did in the statement? You feel very strongly, strongly that this is the time, again, to support any kind of revolution that might pop. What's happening? Why? 
Well, President Trump, if you're listening, what you're doing with Iran is long overdue and it is working. You see this regime for who they are. This is a murderous regime driven by a religious philosophy that will not allow Iran to ever be a peaceful member of the family of nations. The Ayatollah is a religious Nazi. He wants a master religion. He wants to purify Islam and destroy Israel and come after us. World peace and the Ayatollah cannot fit in the same sentence. You got him on the ropes to our European allies. It's disgraceful that you're picking this regime over the people, that you want to do business with this man who's dismembered the Mideast, openly avows uh, trying to destroy the state of Israel, and it's the largest state sponsor of terrorism. If President Trump will keep it up. European businesses are going to pick our economy over Iran. It's not if this regime falls, it's just a matter of when if we keep the pressure on. And I think it's working. You know, this week, uh, the president of Iran said that he wanted to see if we could be sincere if we were interested in getting <laughs> another deal. I'm thinking you're not really interested in offering up sincerity. Before I let you go, when you play golf with the president, do you let him win? I try my best to beat him, I just can't. For me to beat him, he's got to get to be 80 and I got to shoot 80, which oh, is both listen. hard. But but he's a, he's a gracious host, he's a <laughs> lot of fun, he's doing a good job, we have a good time. And uh, any deal with Iran that they would honor is probably not worth having. I just want to thank President Trump for resetting mm -hmm. our foreign policy, leading from the the front, taking on dictators and thugs like the Ayatollah. We're going to bring about regime change without firing a shot. Senator Lindsey Graham, thank you very much. Great to have you from the great state of South Carolina tonight. Take care. All right. Thank you. And there is breaking news tonight. At any moment, we expect to hear from New York Republican Congressman Chris Collins. We are told he will hold a news conference following that indictment of insider trading charges, which broke earlier today. Also, as we roll along in prime time, several big Tuesday races to talk about, including Ohio and Kansas, still too close to call almost 24 hours later. But there is one clear winner in Michigan being called the future of the Republican Party. John James joins me next. And let's flip the script to the Democrats now, where Democrat socialist Alexandria Ocasio Cortez says she is the future because America is no longer soccer moms and minivans. Well, Ben Shapiro says he has some thoughts on that. Stay put. You know, Ben doesn't mince his words. Two hours ago, we were on Live on Outnumbered, and the news broke of insider trading charges against this New York congressman. His attorney at the time said he will be vindicated. He laid out a case uh, for how this was not insider trading. However, Federal prosecutors in New York also laid out their case today. This will be our first chance to hear directly from the congressman. I should mention the Speaker of the House, Paul Ryan, today pulled him off an energy committee saying that the courts will figure this out. But in the meantime, he will not be serving on that committee uh, within the House. Chris Collins, congressman from New York, when he steps up to the lectern, will take you there live. Also developing at this hour, nearly 24 hours after the polls closed in five states, several races are still too close to call. Ohio, the special election there, Republican Troy Balderson is claiming victory before it has become official. He holds a slim margin with just about 1,750 votes against Democrat Danny O'Connor. In the race to be the next governor of Kansas, Republican Chris Kobach holds a 191 vote. That is slim a lead over sitting governor Jeff Collier. But one race is definitive, Michigan's GOP Senate primary, where Iraq War veteran John James beat fellow challenger Sandy Pensler by nine points. President Trump tweeted this, congratulations to a future star of the Republican Party, future Senator John James, a big and bold victory tonight in the great state of Michigan, the first of many. November can't come fast enough. Here now, John James, the Republican nominee for Senate in Michigan. Great to have you on the program tonight. Uh, you know, just to tell Thanks people a, a little bit of about what last night felt, I want to hear directly from you. And now it's day one as you head down the road. 
Uh, last night felt absolutely incredible. Um, it was awesome to, uh, to give the glory to God and also to point out the folks who got me to this point, the grassroots support that we felt since the very, very beginning, folks who believe that Michigan is, uh, is truly a state that uh, is the home of the American dream, is the birthplace of the middle class, and we're finally going to send somebody to Washington who understands what it takes to grow a business. I grew my family business from $35 million to $137 million. But I also understand what it takes to keep America safe. In your last segment with Senator Graham, he spoke about something, uh, the Iranian uh, uh, exporting mm -hmm. of terror and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and hate. And I understand that personally, fighting in Iraq and fighting with Iranian trained fighters that actually took and uh, took American lives, killed American yeah. soldiers. So I have personal experience understanding national security, and I'm looking forward to bringing my experience to bear in Washington. Not to make this all about the military and Iran right now, but you bring up a point that maybe people aren't aware of tonight as much, but we are fighting them on the ground in Syria. I mean, they are, they are going after our men and women on the ground there. Uh, but, but let's move on and talk about you because you've just gotten off a stage with Vice President Pence. What did he say to you? Uh, Vice President Pence is 100% behind me. Uh, Vice President Pence and um, President Donald Trump are 100% behind this race because they know that Michigan is in play. They know that Debbie Stabenow is vulnerable because for 43 years as an elected official and 20 years in Washington, she's gotten nothing done for the state of Michigan. Uh, they recognize that I'm going to do everything that I can to bring economic opportunity back to the state of Michigan to continue right. to make sure that we tout our gains and that we don't uh, stay on the defensive. We go on the offensive and we tell everybody that we are the party of emancipation we are the party of suffrage and we are the party mm. of economic opportunity separation of powers and making sure that everybody can achieve the american dream yeah those are interesting things to bring up particularly uh from an african-american uh candidate and in a state like michigan where you had just so flint michigan under the um the leadership of democrats and i understand you want to flip that i i want to kind of leave on that line because that's what people are thinking you know politics are local so what will you change for Michigan and oh by the way did it get enough attention uh, in 2016 from the other side of the political aisle well, I came back from Iraq because while I was over fighting, I saw uh, pictures on armed forces networks of areas of the places you just mentioned, Flint, Saginaw, mm -hmm. Detroit, Benton mm -hmm. Harbor, that looked worse than the combat zone I was flying in. So I came back and helped create jobs. And what we need to do is make sure that we continue to push forward the, the opportunity zones that just got signed in the Tax Cuts and Job Act that our president moved forward. Our president's numbers are moving forward. He's in the 29% approval rating. But right now, African Americans are in a situation where the Democratic Party is ignoring them and we have a Republican Party that's now uh, we have a Republican Party now that's paying attention I'm gonna be listening learning before I lead and I'm uh, I'm happy to not have a black or a white message but a red mm -hmm. white and blue message and make sure that I bring forward and get results that Debbie Stabenow has not gotten red white and blue all the way and thank you for your service John James congratulations on last night and thanks for being on the program thank you for having me go Absolutely. to John James for Senate.com I appreciate your support bye-bye all right he got it in there did you hear it Lisa yeah. Lisa Booth now <laughs> Fox News contributor uh, on sometimes with me on Outnumbered, so we like to Hi, go Harris. like that. Hey, chairman of the Harris Poll and former presidential pollster to Bill and Hillary Clinton. Great to see you as well. Thank you uh, for being yeah. on the program tonight. The Harris Poll, not my own. Uh, <laughs> you know, let's talk about, if we can, the Democrat Party right now. And opportunities, I'll Lisa, start with you just real quickly. Opportunities maybe that are there because of a message that is leaning so far left, it would seem. Well, I think right now for Democrats heading into the midterms, basically what they have to run is just an anti Trump message. You look at the totality of these special elections, and it's concerning the fact that Democrats keep outperforming. However, I will caution that with the fact that special elections are special for a reason. Take, for instance, the Arizona 8th hmm. special election. Uh, Debbie Lesko way underperformed in that race. However, Arizona 8 is not even a competitive race looking ahead at November. So, Special elections, there's a microscope on the race, so the dynamics are a little bit different than, you know, an actual midterm election race. Mark Penn, you have one thing, though, that we know and we have seen it, and that is intensity on your side of the aisle. Um, but it is confusing. You know, who's really wearing, I, I guess, the messaging pants of the party right now? Is it the, the far, far left and those socialist Democrats or someone else? Well, I, I think you have to differentiate between the voters 
and kind of what you see on cable TV. I think there's no question that Donald Trump is in charge of the Republican Party, but he's not winning over swing voters. On the Democratic Party, what we learned is socialists are not in charge of the Democratic Party. None of the Sanders backed candidates, you know, emerged from their primaries mm -hmm. yesterday. Some of them lost quite badly. This whole socialist movement's been overplayed. 10 or 20 percent of Americans are socialists. This country is not taking a turn. This party is not taking a turn to socialism. It is like that hit song. It is meeting people in the middle. And I think that's <laughs> what you saw in last night's primaries. Uh, you know, Lisa, as you go forward, um, we're 90 days away now. I guess you can't even really count this day. We're 89 days away now, right? We're almost wrapping this one. It's kind of crazy. Uh, is there something within the party for Republicans outside of the president's mojo as he touches down and helps candidates that they can really lean on? I'm not hearing as much about the economy, and that is a local and a national issue. It is. And look, I think for Republicans, the, the biggest challenge that they have is the fact that we have so many open competitive seats. And I think it's also some of these members that haven't had to run a tough race in a while. Those are the challenges Republicans are hmm. facing. However, I will also say that Republicans have, in fact, won eight out of the nine special elections. So I think Republicans have to work a lot harder to get their voters to turn out to vote. We've already seen Dem enthusiasm is high. They're in the minority. They want to retake the House. So they're going to be supercharged and excited to get out to the polls. So Republicans have to work harder. But I think if they do it uh, and, you know, our candidates run good races, then mm -hmm. we may lose some seats, but we may not lose the House specifically. Uh, you know, Mark, I'm, I'm curious in places like where you've got Joe Manchin, Joe Donnelly, Heidi Heitkamp, those particular Democrats who, you know, may lean a little bit uh, toward a center line or even right. What, what do you predict is going to happen with them? Well, look, I, I think they are going to have tough races, but most of them are really beloved in their state. Somebody like Senator Manchin is really mm -hmm. beloved in West Virginia. And this is where, the, is this always a national election or is it a local? Well, Donald Trump is certainly nationalizing the election and making it about him. And he's at 45 percent approval, not over 50. And that means that the Republicans, if that's their message, because after all, the Republicans don't really have a leadership. Ryan has quit. Hmm. They don't have a message. There's no there's no real Republican card. It's Donald Trump. And he's at 45. The Democrats, on the other hand, once they shake this notion that they've moved too far to the left, they may do better in many of these races localizing it. It's you about know, the it's voters in those states. It's about people who care. We look at, at Ohio. We're waiting for those provisional and absentee ballots to come in. But those suburbs where a lot of those are going to come in, actually, the president was right around 54, 55 percent uh, in terms of his ability to win in those areas. We'll see if that translates in that race as well. Too close to call, as they're calling it now. It's great to see you, Mark and Lisa. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you, Harris. Have a great night. You too. Up next, the socialist movement not making many waves last night. We were just talking about that, despite media darling Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez flooding the airways with ideas like this. They say, how are you going to pay for it? as though they haven't used these same ways to pay for unlimited wars, to pay for trillion dollar tax cuts and tax cut extensions. So I ask, and you see Ben Shapiro there, where does socialism actually work? We'll talk about it. He has a whole lot to say on this. Also, we're awaiting that news conference. Uh, Representative Chris Collins of New York charged today with insider charging an indictment that was full faceted. His attorneys are ready to fight it, uh, but he's already been taken off at least one committee by House Speaker Paul Ryan. A lot to talk about. Our first time to hear directly from this congressman, and we will bring it to you live as he steps up to the lectern. Stay close.
pressed by federal prosecutors in the state of New York. His attorney has said all day long in a statement that his client will be vindicated and there will be uh, a, a case mounted with vigorous defense to clear his good name. I'm reading directly from that attorney statement now. As this happens, we will take you there live. They're running about 60 minutes behind uh, that congressman, but as soon as it happens, you'll see it here on Fox. Meanwhile, this is developing. The future of the Democrat Party as we head into the midterms, starting tomorrow, 89 days. New York congressional candidate and self-described Democratic Socialist Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, her way forward is the right way, she says, as she has some big issues with the current outlook of her party. Take a listen. We have not had a party that has been investing in its own future. So... We have people who are constantly fundraising for their own reelection. The average age of a House Democrat right now is 65 years old. Their heyday was in the 90s when, like, you know, kids had like Furbies and like parents that you had like soccer moms with like two vans and stuff like Furbies and two vans. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's, that's a dream. <laughs> that's not America anymore. <laughs> If we could only get her to read a book on the Middle East so she knows that Palestine's not a country. Uh, here's how to respond in one way. Ben Shapiro is editor-in-chief of DailyWire.com. I say that with some jest in my voice, but not really, because, I mean, I just had on Mark Penn, used to work for the Clintons. This is not the Democratic Party of old. What is it? Uh, well, it's, it's the new Democratic Socialist Party, and this is the wave of the future, according to Tom Perez over at the DNC. What's really incredible about all of this is that if Republicans could simply make this a referendum on democratic extremism, on the fact that this is not even Nancy Pelosi's party anymore, it's Ocasio-Cortez's party, uh, then Republicans would have, I think, a much better shot in 2018 and, and going into the future. The fact is that she makes statements that are factually untrue on a regular basis. She makes claims about socialism that are wild and crazy. She wants to spend, and Bernie Sanders' plans, they, they want to spend something like $218 trillion over the next 30 years, which would require a quadrupling of the percentage of GDP that we spend on government over the next 30 years. And she doesn't have to answer a single hard question from an interviewer at any point because she refuses to do anything remotely resembling well, an interview with somebody on the other side of the aisle. Yeah, and, and that wouldn't be the only reason why the tough questions might not come. I mean, they have come, and they've been difficult sometimes for her. She's, you know, oh, the Middle East foreign policy is not my thing, so on and so forth. Um, and she struggled in some areas, but quite frankly, I, I thought her district was here in New York. And, and the Democrats are putting her out on this main national stage, and that gets complicated no matter whom they surround her with, like Bernie Sanders, whoever it is. I mean, you have a direct clap back to the soccer moms line. Yeah, I mean, the fact is that the soccer moms aren't driving vans anymore. They're driving SUVs. And also the purpose of having a van is that you don't have to have two of them. I'm not sure when there was ever a, a soccer mom who had two vans. The whole purpose of a minivan is you can fit everybody in one vehicle. But it's also factually untrue. The fact is that the number of mothers in American society is actually increasing for the first time in years mm. over the past 10 years. Uh, you're actually seeing an increase in the number of women who are staying at home. I don't know why the Democrats are now appealing to a crowd that does not include soccer moms. If they want to win elections in the future, it seems like that should be particularly the crowd that they're aiming at. You know, what is it? The, the passion versus the policy. I had a guest on Outnumbered Overtime earlier today, Noel Nikpour, who put it that way. And she said, as long as they stay in the passion lane, uh, that's fine. But what is the policy that goes along? What socialist country do we know of where this, these policies have actually worked? That's my question. You know, and they keep shifting the answer, right? The USSR, they say, was not socialist. They say now Cuba was not socialist and Venezuela is not socialist. Now they really like the Nordic countries, which they say are socialist, ignoring, of course, the fact that all wealth generated in Nordic countries was generated by capitalism and their social redistribution programs have actually created massive costs for those countries. The, the attempt to label what are capitalist countries with a few socialist social systems on top of those as socialist countries as a whole, even those countries reject it. Denmark's prime minister came to the United States a couple of years ago when Bernie Sanders was saying Denmark was a socialist country. And he said directly about Bernie Sanders, no, we're not a socialist country, we're a capitalist country. It's easy to stand up for Marxism when you keep shifting the explanation for why Marxism has failed. Why do you think people want to hear about democratic socialists? Why do you think they're listening to Ocasio-Cortez? And, and by the way, most Democrats say, that's not my party. But generationally, neither is Nancy Pelosi. Dianne Feinstein couldn't even get an endorsement. That's right. I mean, I, th I think that the reason you're seeing people resonate to this is because the Democrats 
don't actually have a lot of new ideas. And anything that looks like moderation would require them to reach across the aisle. So they're stuck between their own mm. Trump derangements and from their hatred for the president and the fact that they need an, a separate agenda. And, and this creates the need for, a, for an Ocasio-Cortez. Well, Ben Shapiro looks into it and writes about it and is on the program tonight very candidly. Thank you. Great to see you. You too. Up next. I would have never dreamed that all those coffins that were coming back had anything related to my father. A dog tag identified in the remains returned by North Korea to the United States, now back with the family of a Korean War veteran. Veteran Bill Bennett is coming up with historical significance. Don't miss this. as it came back and out of all of these thousands of people that are we're the only one to have certitude on at least I mean it's is it possible obviously my father is alive someplace and he lost his dog tag that's I mean that's just improbable so we've got some certitude now Wow, an emotional moment on the road to closure today the military handed over the dog tag identified in the boxes of remains returned from North Korea last week to the family of Master Sergeant Charles H. McDaniel. McDaniel, believed to have been killed in combat in 1950. His sons, Charles Jr. and Larry, you just saw, were so young, they have little memory of their dad. Joining me now, Bill Bennett, host of the Bill Bennett Podcast, former Secretary of Education, and now a Fox News contributor. Sir, great to have you on the program tonight. And I lean you. in your direction because you hold uh, so much about the history. You've served under many presidents and counseled. Uh, and, and what do you have to add about this moment that really teaches us the meaning of those dog tags? Isn't it interesting with all the things in life and all the things that matter to people that this dog tag would matter so much? It's a touch, it's, it's, it's an instantiation of the memory of this man. And you can see how overwhelmed those uh, young men, young men, they're called, your, your reporter called them young men, uh, to have that in their hands. And then the remains coming uh, as well. Uh, this is a, a very important fact about human nature. Uh, we treasure uh, these memories. We treasure whatever we can put in our hand and hold on to. Uh, we are a spiritual people, one of the most religious people in the world, Americans, and yet this touch of mortality is something we can hold in our hand when they examine these boxes to see if they're the remains of uh, these soldiers will mean the world uh, to, their, uh, to their families. This goes way back, uh, way back in history, even ancient uh, times. Mm -hmm. What will happen? with the body. Uh, what will you do with my remains? Hector and Achilles talk mm. about that at Troy. And Hector says, let's return the body. Whoever wins, return the body uh, to the other's family. Achilles refuses and doesn't. And then humiliates him by humiliating the body. And what's interesting here is the family of Hector grieves not only for his death, but for the humiliation of his body. Wow. A deep reminder of those principles that are so much ingrained in, in war. Uh, as a military brat, I have heard that story many times in my life over, but, sure. but it bears reminding sure. us because this is such a hinge point now in history. We have an armistice in place 
It, it was just the end of fighting 65 years ago, that Korean War. There's so much more ground to, to really work over to get to the point where we actually call it peace. And in part of that process, it is what you say, the respect of the war dead. And this is just the beginning of this journey now. That's right. Yeah, uh, our younger son is a Marine. You know, they say, as other servicemen do, we leave no man behind. Mm -hmm. In some cases, it was necessary to leave the man behind. But now something of that man comes back, something of that man returns. And again, I just have to say what the, that means, that gift back, that recovery back to, means, means so much. People are then able to have something tangible by means of which they can, uh, they can remember. It's a, it's a very solemn thing, and it reminds us in the celebration of something that one might hold or look at, uh, just what a serious and, and, and spiritual people uh, we are. We hold these things to be of great value, mm. and I hope everyone can appreciate what this, uh, what this means. Um, it's, it's, it's a wonderful line of a poet, if you'll allow me, not Greece, but Rome. Virgil says, uh, here too, Things mortal touch the mind, and there are tears for passing things. Here, too, <clears throat> the honorable finds its due. And that's something like that is going through the minds of people uh, as they gather and wait to receive this. Uh, our thoughts are with them. Yeah, and all the families who are waiting for some sort of answers along this journey toward closure yeah. as well. Yeah. There were 55.